We will bring it to the next agenda item, which is our 9.30, 6.4, consideration of update on urgency ordinance number 3107 enacted on 72721, imposing a temporary prohibition moratorium on the issuance of early activation permits for land use projects within the unincorporated area of the County of Lake and update on the Community Development Department operations. And let's see. Oh, actually this is, uh, <laughs> I'll let you go ahead and go, Jessica, Supervisor uh, Pisco or uh, Supervisor Simon, because I think this also, this has a- uh, Sure, yeah, Supervisor Simon and I were tasked um, last, late last spring with um, supporting the community development uh, with a committee and uh, through the time when we did not have a director and kind of assisting when we have a new director and also tasked with streamlining the cannabis application process. So we've been working very closely with uh, Director Darby and um, our CAO Hutchinson and uh, so we've been looking forward to today's report. All right. Yeah. You know, I know that uh, the board had asked for, for an update, and so obviously we've been doing our work with our committee meetings as we move forward, and today is just an update, just to talk about where we're going. Uh, as you know, when we passed the moratorium, there was a time frame that we had to, to work on it, and, um, you know, so today hopefully we'll have some, some good information that's provided, kind of lay out a timeline. That's what we're kind of looking to do. And um, so excited to have that conversation today as we move forward with this uh, this update. And like I said, it was requested of the board to come back and have an update. So we're making sure we take care of that. All right. uh, I don't see Director Darby on. I don't see Director Darby either. Yeah, I've sent a couple reminders to her um, and not hearing from her. Oh, Here there she, she comes. Is. There she, she is. is. Hello. Just started the agenda item. Okay. Um, so uh, where, where should she where probably, she maybe right. Is there a microphone there for her? No. Uh -oh. Should we just have her come up? Yeah. Here? Yeah, I think that would probably be. Yeah. I don't have a computer anymore. I'm glad you're on that side. Uh, if she, we could move, if she wants to be seated, we could move that little table up and give her the hand mic right there. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Control of your PowerPoint. You can sit right here. I'll move right there. I, can, I think that Miles may operate from here. I think so. Oh, I think it says revised. Oops. First one. Revised. First one on top. That's it. It might be easier, Bruno. You just One more thing for you before you let go. Oh, yeah. Give me one second just to get organized here, please. I will like to start off by saying good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Sir morning. Chair, Board of Supervisors, Legal Counsel, and Administration. My name is Mary Darby, and I am the Community Development Director here for Lake County. And the purpose of my presentation here today is to provide an update to the urgency ordinance imposing prohibition to the moratorium on the issuance of early activation permits for land use projects and to also provide an update on the reorganization of the community development department. So kind of bear with me as I go through this because I do have a lot of ordinances to review. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can awesome. hear you just fine. Thank you. 
And happy belated Valentine's Day to everyone. Here we go. So today what I'm going to do is the agenda is going to look like this. We're going to do a little bit of a background. We're going to look at the purpose of adding the new ordinance. We're going to look at the revised ordinance, where we are, where we're going, how are we going to get there, and what our next steps are to have a successful revised ordinance. I've added some data and other slides into this presentation for um, background purposes. So for background information, oops, a daisy, I have to sit here and there we go. So um, in July 27, 2021, as you know, the board approved the ordinance 3106, which is an urgency ordinance requiring a hydrology report and drought management plan to provide enhanced water analysis for our cannabis projects. In addition, on July 27, 2021, ordinance number 3107 was approved by the board for a 45-day interim ordinance, emergency ordinance, temporarily prohibiting the issuance of early activation permits for land use projects. In August of 3031, the board came back with ordinance number 3111, and the purpose of that ordinance was to extend the urgency ordinance number 3107 to establish a moratorium on the issuance of early activation permits for land use projects and to provide additional time to prepare studies and reports as it relates to the ordinance. On August 24, 2021, I apologize, I should have come before August 31st, the board approved ordinance number 3110 um, ordinance to prohibit water hauling to unpermitted cannabis cultivation sites. So let's talk a little bit about what ordinance, the urgency ordinance 3111 did. So for findings and declarations. So the purpose of the ordinance was to demonstrate that a current and immediate th threat to the public health, safety, and welfare of our communities continues to exist, which required the extension of the ordinance until um, July 24th, 2022. The ordinance, the purpose of the ordinance was to allow staff time to address problems related to the issuance of early activation permits, address the backlog of early activation applications, complete the necessary studies and reports to fully evaluate the projects, cannabis projects, and to support the contemplated zoning ordinance proposed amendments and which staff will be making um, soon. I'll just say it like that. So how are early activation permits defined? And you all may all know this, but me only being here for a little longer than four months, it was very important that I actually went back and studied what early activations, what the ordinance says, what the purpose was, so I could properly analyze what we're doing and where we're trying to go with early activation permits. So according to section 27.4 for early activation of youth, it states that notwithstanding the provisions of section 2127.10 pertaining to uses generally permitted with a use permit and those uses listed as permitted subject to first obtaining either a minor use permit in each zoning district, minor or major use permit in each zoning district. I know that's a mouthful. But the part that really kind of um, grabbed me was, it stated also in this section, 27.4, that the planning division may issue an early activation permit allowing for the immediate activation of any use requiring a minor use permit or a major use permit subject to conditions. And with these early activation permits, the early activation permits from what I could tell so far were actually treated like use permits and they required all the analysis, pretty much, staff was an analyzing the early activation permits as if they were use permits, but there were actually two separate criteria in which these use permits and the early, active, act, early activation permits should have followed. So I'm gonna go through what the requirements are, or the criteria for early activation permits. And I'm sorry, I sound like I'm out of breath because I ran downstairs. <laughs> okay. Okay, so in order to determine or to deem an early activation permit complete, um, early activation permits shall not allow any construction, 
grading, removal of mature, mature trees on the property. From my experience with dealing with the early activation permits, a lot of them have been doing that. So an early activation permit should not have been accepted based on that criteria alone. Second, early activations in order to deem it complete. Adequate measures shall be included in the early activation permit application and implemented upon commencement of the use for dust control, parking, traffic safety, drainage, erosion controlled, waste disposal, and the health department requirements. Again, I will say that some of the early activation permits that we received should not have been received because we do have a lot of issues with our current applications, even when we talk about traffic, parking, or dust control. The third criteria was that, or is, that the early activation permit must be accompanied by an application for the applicable, applicable minor or major use permit. So when I first got here, I got a little confused because I didn't read this section. So I was advised that early activation permits should not have been, they should not have been accepted along with the minor or major use permit. And I took that information and I ran with it. But then later I learned, working with legal, Nicole Johnson, which is great, I learned that the early activation permit process and the use permit process are actually two separate processes. And we should not, in our department, we should not have accepted those together because they actually have two defined criteria in which they should operate. And if we would have done that, then we would have learned and discovered that the early activation permit, a lot of the ones in which we accepted, should have never been accepted as a project in our department. The other criteria in terms of deeming a project complete under early activation was that the early activation permit shall expire six months from the date of the issuance or upon issuance or denial of the required minor or major use permit or resolution, or resolution of any appeal thereof. The early activation permits in the six months process in terms of termination, a lot of the projects, and I'll review this as we go along, are actually still in queue. And because they are in queue, they have not been approved, therefore their early activation permit date has not expired. So they are all still pending. And as I go along, I will actually share with you which projects in the terms of early activation have been approved and which ones are pending. Further criteria for the early activation permits. The planning division may deny an application for an early activation permit for early activation of use if the use may result in adverse environmental impacts or if the use is currently being operated in violation of this chapter. So I look at this and I read it and it states that if the use may result in adverse environmental impacts. <clears throat> well, from the time I've been here, I've noticed that there have been a lot of environmental Im adverse impacts with some of the projects that we've been looking at, whether or not it relates to odor, noise, traffic, and other issues that are deemed in the, in the use permit or the early activation permits in terms of adverse impacts. So a lot of the projects, again, should not have been accepted. Early activation is not permitted for uses listed in section 22.6 of this chapter, and that's pretty much deals with use permits. And the application for an early activation permit shall be accompanied with a fee equivalent to that established by the board. That fee is very minimal. It's of like $200 or something like that. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. But the staff review time of an early activation permit is basically the same amount of time that it would take for staff to review a use permit. So that became an issue as well. The reason why I put the environmental review section here on the slide, it talks about in section four of ordinance 3111, it states that the environmental review process is exempt for early activation. That seemed to be a little conflicting with what our requirements are and how we're actually going to protect the public safety and welfare of our communities. Now, here comes the fun part. Oops, sorry, that was my fault. There we go. The current status of early activation permits. 
So after the approved early activations after July 27, 2021, based on our adopted ordinance number 3111, has only been two. Early activations pending received in 2021 is currently 33. I kind of, you're gonna see these numbers again, but I'm gonna run them by you because I want them to kind of be fresh in your head. Totally we have, currently we have a total of 243 cannabis cultivation applications. The cultivation projects itself is 239. The other remainders of those is broken down, are broken down into manufacturing projects, which are two, processing plants, which is three, and micro business project, which is one. We have two retail sales projects requiring a use permit. In terms of the number of projects that have either been withdrawn, appealed, or denied, we have four withdrawn, five denied, and seven appeals. So that brings us to where are we now? So we kind of have a background of where we came from. Now let's talk about where we are now. So there are currently 100 approved cannabis cultivation permits out of the 243. Let me know if I'm kind of going out because I'm turning to the side to make sure you can hear me. So there are a total of 100, 100 approved permit applications for cannabis cultivations, again, out of the total 243 that we, that we have received in our department. Out of the 243 approved, you can actually, are pending, you can actually see on this map, which depicts the number of cannab cannabis locations, and this is based on acreage. So the diagram actually shows whether or not it's under an acre or over 100 acres. And these are where the, the cannabis cultivation sites are currently located, are being proposed. There you go. So here further we break it down a little more, which it makes it a little bit easier on the eye. So you can actually see the 100 approved projects are in green. You can see the 134 pending projects are in yellow. And the denied or withdrawn projects of nine are in red. And I'll just let you look at that for just a second. Okay, thank you. Here, this map depicts where these proposed or pending projects are located based on district. District one, there are approximately 27 projects which have been approved and there are 44 projects which are pending. I would like to um, note that this slide or this map was actually devised in December of 2021, so some of the numbers have changed a little. In District 2, there are three projects that have been approved, and there are five projects that are pending. District 3, there are 18 projects that were approved, and there are 33 projects that are pending. District 4, there are 18 projects that are approved, and 27 projects which are pending. Are pending. And District 5, there are 17 projects approved and 13, I'm sorry, 31 projects pending. We also illustrate the acreage for each project, whether or not it was approved or pending, for your information. Okay. Do you mind if I ask a quick question to clarify? Yes. This is the uh, cultivation area uh, or the total, um, it's just the cultivation area, not the canopy area, correct? Well, here, before we were able to break up our cultivation area from our canopy area, so this is total. This is cultivation and canopy. However, I do have data that I can provide later, which breaks up the cultivation area from the canopy area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oops, I think I'm going the wrong way. 
This is just a, uh, as of February the 15th, our numbers again. So again, you have total projects of 243. The 100 projects have been approved. 135 are pending. Nine are denied or withdrawn. Um, and for further information, one project is being prepared for an appeal. 15 projects are being prepared for staff reports for our planning commission hearing coming soon. 53 projects are in our initial study and sequel review phase. 39 projects are under agency or tribal review. 39 projects are under completeness review and awaiting further documentations. And 40 projects have been transferred over to our consultants, which is LACO. And I have data that I can provide later for you if you would like to know the status of where LACO, where they are in their process. So, after going through the background and giving you a kind of status of where we are, let's talk about where we're going. So it's very important because water, of course, is a big issue here. So our GIS person, name is Andrew Amalong. He is also our cannabis program manager. He has been doing a phenomenal job. He has actually provided and created these maps for us. Um, along with Mary Claybon, who has provided the data and updated of where we are. So they have been working very hard to make sure that we stay on top of this project and to identify where these projects are going. So in terms of where we're going, we're starting to look at the watersheds in the county, all the watersheds. And so we're mapping out where our existing or pending projects are along the watersheds. So this information will be actually flushed out a little bit more when I give my next presentation about where we are with water. But I wanted to provide you an illustration of where we are with the watersheds. So this is Big Valley Watershed, Shoreline Watershed, sorry, come on, ah. Thurston Lake and Lower Lake watersheds, Upper Puta and Middle Puta watersheds, Cash Creek watershed, El River watershed, Middle Creek and Scotts Creek watersheds, and those are the watersheds. And those will be working, we're working on those currently to flush out the information a little better. Okay? So how do we get to where we're trying to go and what's our end result? What are we, where are we trying to achieve? and where we're trying to say we have are or we are successful with this project in the 243 projects in which we have either pending or approved. Okay. So I'm gonna stop here for just a second and just talk before I move on to the next subject. So with the projects that we have in queue, we are looking, we are working with the consultants to make sure that we are um, expeditiously pushing these projects forward. A lot of the projects require initial study, so we do have to determine the environmental review of these projects in terms of CEQA. I have found that in dealing with a lot of these projects, they do require environmental impact reports or they do require some type of ne negative mitigated declaration. So 33 of the projects are still, they still need initial studies. And so that is kind of like where we are now. Staff is actually working on initial studies. We did not transfer the initial studies purview over to our consultants. So staff is diligently working to um, conduct those studies for the initial studies. That's where we are with those projects. We are hoping, we are looking at other consultants to see if that we can find other help to move projects forward. It's just an idea that we're looking at to see if we can move the projects forward a little more expeditiously. But in the meantime, we have designed a process with LACO for internal review as well as external review to move these projects forward. And the process with the LACO and our cannabis planning team is coming along quite well. In terms of, so we're going to switch gears and before I do that, do you have any questions regarding cannabis cultivation and the 243 projects? Everyone I, except. I, 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 have a, <laughs> I have a quick question for you. I know that uh, in our ordinance it requires that applicants submit annual water uh, reports or water use reports. Uh, is that being um, reviewed when looking at the water maps to make sure that it's not just the estimated amount that they say that they're using, but what their wells actually have metered? Because uh, I'm always kind of curious how close 
is their actual water use versus what their estimates are, because that's all that they are, are estimates uh, when we go through the initial study and the process to, through the Planning Commission. So actually, that's a good question. And the answer to your question is we are working on it. So when we actually get the reports, staff at this time has not been trained to really look at and analyze hydrology reports, drought management plans, and actually look at what the requirements are for water sites and how much water usage is required. However, we have hired an excellent person. His name is Michael McGinnis. He is our new principal planner who has excellent skills and CEQA review, and he's doing a phenomenal job in terms of looking at those reports and making sure that that water, adequate water, is provided before we move the projects forward. Thank you. Thank you. The watersheds will become a part of the review as he continues. He's been here now for two weeks. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the community development department and the reorganization of the community development department. So from what I understand from history, that the department with the cannabis project, all the planners were pretty much kind of geared towards working on cannabis projects. So therefore, a lot of the other projects that we look at, whether or not they were long range or short range projects or lot line adjustments, mergers, or any other type of land use project that wasn't dealing with cannabis was kind of put on the back burner. That caused a big problem in our department, and I'm sure that a lot of people are probably upset, but we are moving those projects forward as diligently as we possibly can. In order to ensure that we're not just having the entire planning team working on cannabis projects, we are redesigning the department so that we have a planning, cannabis planning team, and then we have another team which is divided up into short range planners and long range planners. And so if you look at this chart here, you'll see that I'm at the top of the chart, and then we have a vacant deputy director position we just hired a staff service analysis analyst. Her name is Sarah Whitman. She started yesterday. Very energetic. Um, we also have hired a business software analyst. And this position is very important because the business software analyst is the person who's going to ensure that our projects get into a cellar. Not only is he going to ensure that our projects get into a cellar, He's going to train the staff on actually how to use a cellar. And most importantly, he's going to help us create those invoices that we need so the planning department can actually obtain some money for a budget. <laughs> so he has a very important position. You have a question? No, I'm just, I'm just listening. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> that's no problem. And, and very happy to hear about that update because I know that that's been a... Uh, uh, a very deep hole uh, that we've been putting CDD into by not having that capability to bill for all the hours above and beyond what the initial fees are. So very thankful for that. Yes, sir. And my only caution is that CDD, we are dynamite. We are dynamic and we're innovative. And I think that sometimes our staff is not actually um, receive the accolades that they probably should receive. They work very hard and although they may not have the skill set that we need at this time to move projects forward, they have the heart. And sometimes having the heart is even more important than having the skill set. And I think that they're overlooked a lot. I think that they should receive more praise and I think they should receive more thank yous. Thank you. Just wanted to put that little plug in there. So then we have our principal platter. Uh, Michael McGinnis, again, like I said, he's only been here a couple of weeks. Uh, no, two months. He's been here two months. And we've broken this section off. So we have our cannabis planning team and our cannabis planning manager, Andrew Amalong. And with Andrew, he's working with Eric Porter, which is our associate planner. He's working with Mary Claibon, who we just promoted up to assistant planner. She was our CDC cannabis intake person. She's a star. You want to hold on to her? Um, and then we have Jamie Henry, who, which we just hired as the CDD technician who replaced Mary Claibon's position. And Mary is directly training Jamie, so that's working out perfectly. This is the team that works with LACO. This is the team that's dividing the process. This is the team that's making the projects move. Very important team. Other projects that the Cannabis Project um, team is working on, our pre-application meetings, use permits, the minor use permits, 
zoning clearances, zoning permits, they should not be working on the zoning ordinance, except for the text amendment <laughs> to the re, um, revised cannabis ordinance, and then of course the GIS. And then for the long range planning team, we divided that team up into two areas. So we have long range projects, short range projects. This team comprised of Eric, we are really stretching him thin, Eric Porter, Victor Fernandez, which is our associate planner, Satir Ham, our assistant planner. However, Satir has resigned and her last day is February the 25th. We have Catherine Schaefer, she is out on family medical leave. Trish Turner, who is also a dynamite CDD technician in land use. We have Be Peggy Barthel, she's our extra help in our research planner position. We are actually advertising and getting ready to interview. The type of projects this team actually look at or work on for long range is the general plan update, the community retrofit program, the drought management plan. Short range projects, mergers, lot line adjustments, parcels, subdivisions, variances, zoning clearances, zoning permits, and the update of the zoning ordinance. Yep, that's it. And I only originally added planning. So although CDD has three separate distinct divisions, as you know, so we have building and safety, we have code enforcement, and we have planning. So when I first got here, I thought that my strategy would be to take the department or the division that needed the most help and jump in there and help that division. So building the safety was kind of cruising on its own, so I kind of left them alone, although there are some things I recommend that can be done with building and safety. And then code enforcement was another area in which, we, which I believe that we needed to um, strengthen. And so by doing that, I actually promoted Marcus Beltramo. He is a star. He is really making that team work. We have hired two additional code enforcement officers. We have one code enforcement officer position that's vacant right now. However, it's, in, it's being advertised. That will be the position for the cannabis officer. He is training everyone. And we've also broke, he has also broken down the job duties and requirements of all the code enforcement officers and the sections of the county in which they would work. So I'll let you look at that for a second. Quick yes, question. Um, I know with the roadmap task force that there was the looking at uh, getting the dedicated is our uh, Linda Rosas bill and Antonio Chavez, uh, those that are assigned to the roadmap task force, uh, or is it kind of a, a, a different um, coordination for that? At this time, after having my meeting with Mr. Beltramo, I think that he is going to identify who's going to be assigned to the roadmap task force and who's actually going to be assigned as the cannabis officer. So that's, that's pending, but we do have the officers to move forward. Awesome. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Next steps. So our next steps are, we're looking at the fees and fines. We're looking at our cannabis checklist. We're also looking at our strategies on um, cannabis cultivation projects from a small scale and a large scale because there are different processes in which we have to um, operate or move those along. So for our small, our small scale cannabis project in terms of enforcement, we're looking at identifying the non-permitted cultivation sites which are in violation. We're looking at contacting the owner for consent to conduct inspections to verify plant count. And we're also looking at remedies to initiate um, for zoning clearances for those are for small scale. In terms of large scale, it's a little bit more involved. So we're looking at our illegal groves of property owners on site and off site. We're looking at illegal groves on properties where property owners are unaware. And we're looking for property owners that do not live in the area where cultivation sites are illegal. And we're also looking at property owner, when the property owner discover that they have an illegal grow on their site. So um, the process is just a little different. We identify the non-permitted Violation sites, we contact the owner for consent to conduct an inspection to verify plant count on search, our search warrant. We partner with the sheriff department to determine chip plants on site and haul to dump. So Marcus have been working or meeting with the planning or the sheriffs to work that out and we do have another meeting to kind of funnel all this through. Um, and that's where we are in that particular guards. Also, I would just like to add that we are looking at new uniforms for our code enforcement officers. They are beautiful. <laughs> so we're looking at a um, tactical green with beige pants. 
that they can use. We're also looking at identifying the new vehicle that we have to be wrapped to let everyone know that this is code enforcement. So that will be our first prototype with our vehicle. So they would have big bold letters that says code enforcement on it and the new uniforms will be coming. And we also have badges now for our new code enforcement officers because they've been harassed <laughs> in the community. I have a question on, on this information here. Mm -hmm. um, between the identify the non-permitted cultivation site is in violation, I would suspect that the contact with the owner is if there's proof of the violation. Uh, at what point, because we've been talking about administrative fines and we just finalized them not too long ago, is that between one and two that the uh, fines start if it passes, uh, I think we said five to ten days or something like that? Uh, would it be at that point that the fines start? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sorry, if you go back one, it talks <laughs> about satellite imagery on there. Uh, how will you be using satellite imagery? Is that as a follow-up to a complaint? Is that as a way to identify what is happening? Uh, what, what is your strategy in continuing to use the satellite imagery? So I have been advised by my code enforcement manager that the way the satellite imagery would be used is that each officer has their own assigned district and they would periodically do a sweep of their area to identify if there's anything unusual in their area just as a kind of a daily use. However, if there are sites that have been identified as being in violation, they would use that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would they, would, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mm -hmm. would, would they employ the administrative fines at that time or would they go through a process to notify them and then come? Unfortunately, there's a process. And so they would have to go through that process. So they have so many days to notify them, so many days for the property owner to clear up the violation and then even way before they even get to like an abatement or anything like that. So there are, there's a process. Are, are, and just one more question. Are they using the, um, uh, the satellite images for uh, anything else besides grows? Like for example, like uh, code violations when it comes to like people squatting and multiple people living in uh, properties, if that makes sense? Yes, it does. And currently, I cannot say that we've been using it for that reason, but that's an excellent idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I'll make sure that's incorporated. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, no. All right, here come a fun topic. Let's talk about scenic combining districts, okay? So I think we've kind of... I've been working with legal and I think we kind of iron this one out for right now, but I do understand that in the future that an ordinance will be forthcoming from legal to kind of tie all this together. But what we did is, Nicole Johnson um, and I, what we did is kind of looked at what's existing in our code ordinance currently that could be legally defensible to identify where the city combining districts are, how we measure them in terms of where they're inside the district, are outside the district, and I'll just sum it up really quickly. So we're using our sectional district maps as well as our parcel maps to see where the scenic combining district is. So there was, the con I think the confusion was that in the ordinance is stated in Article 3, I believe, it talked about the district boundaries. So in the district boundaries for scenic combining, it interp the interpretation was that if the district, if the scenic combining district touched the parcel, then the entire parcel was considered in the scenic combining district. But since then, we have identified in our assessor parcel maps that there are actually boundaries in, in the maps with the square footage. So we can actually clearly depict where that district is and then define where that boundary is, which actually um, takes care of that Article 3 with de the determination of the boundaries. Okay. So you can have a greenhouse outside of a scenic combining district alone a county or a state route, but you have specific criteria that goes with that. And so at first we were saying and interpreting that you could not, it was just prohibited because if the scenic combining district touched a lot, then the entire parcel was in the lot and we were saying that the greenhouse was prohibited. However, that is no longer the case. The case now is if you're along a county road or a state highway, then there are criteria that we look at to determine whether or not the greenhouse could be 5,000 square feet, 
are 10,000 square feet. So you can have a greenhouse outside of the Sadie Kambani district, but you have criteria that must be followed and met. And there are no variances for Sadie Kambani districts yet. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> I'm saying that just in case one of you say, hey, I want a variance. <laughs> um, but there are no variances for Sadie Kambani districts. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing that to us. I know that we've had a couple of people, um, I believe, speaking right here uh, in public comment about the issue. Uh, I know it's been brought up multiple times throughout the latest planning commissions, uh, and I've received some emails about it. Um, so thank you very much for coming to a uh, resolution for this and uh, reading it over. It seems to be uh, uh, it seems to be uh, acceptable. Um, if I understand correctly, the scenic combining district is kind of like the exclusion zone. It's kind of a nebulous cloud. It doesn't necessarily form shape to the properties themselves, uh, which is where you can have portions of the properties that are good to go, where other portions are not because of the cloud that covers only portions of it. Am I correct on that? That is correct. And I will interpret your cloud to, um, <laughs> to um, complement the area plans of the communities of the county. So the scenic combining districts were actually um, driven or, or, or they were are actually drawn to complement each area plan. And so they change. So when we go in, we look at each, we meaning staff of CDD, we look at each project independently, individually to see whether or not what the impacts are for the scenic combining district. We look at the general plan requirements. We look at the area plan requirements. And then we look at the zoning ordinance requirements based on whether or not it's adjacent to a county road or a state highway. And um, I know in the, uh, if you go to the cannabis GIS map, there's all kinds of different layers that you can um, look at and not look at. Uh, there's water districts, there's um, the farming, uh, uh, farmland protection zone, there's the exclusion zone, like there's all kinds of different layers. Will that become one of the layers to be able to be able to identify from a public perspective uh, when looking at should I comment on this or should I submit an application on this? Uh, will that be available for the public to be able to see? I think that it should be available. I can't um, right now tell you where in the area of priorities that would be, but right now that, that would be something eventually that we could have as a GIS layer. Okay. And if I understood correctly, this interpretation is the way it's going to be interpreted as of now, and then the ordinance will come to us just to finalize that? That is correct. Thank you. You're welcome. I, you have a question? Yes, I, well, I just had a comment because I think also in hearing this, there was a meeting between myself and Victor Fernandez and uh, Mike Herman out of Clear Lake Oaks who had identified some GIS issues when it comes to this, um, a lot of what we're talking about, and uh, it sounds like some of that might be cleared up through what you're working on, so I appreciate that as well. I hope so, and I, I just, the last thing that I said in terms of, as we review these projects, of course, they will also be reviewed against CEQA. Everything's reviewed against CEQA, okay. Okay. So just in the future, as we move forward with the ordinance, the revised ordinance, we'll be looking at the fees and fines, no, noise, odor, security, and illegal growth, just to know, let you know where we're going in the future with CDD looking at this ordinance. Um, some of the other things that we didn't address in our ordinance that I think that we should address would be the new thing in town with cannabis, and that's um, the layering of the cannabis sites, which is the auto flower, I'm learning a lot here, <laughs> and the tearing of cannabis. So this is just a diagram to show you how we created our internal flow workflow with LACO. I can share that with anyone later on. And here, we actually took the current, um, the current cannabis ordinance and the revised cannabis or ordinance, and we put them side by side, and we said, what has changed? So as we move forward in our next meeting, we're gonna to explain to you what actually has changed between the current ordinance and the proposed ordinance. And by the time you get this next time, there will be another chart over here, and the re it will actually state what the state requirements are for the ordinance. So you have a comprehensive overview of where we are, where we're going, and where we're trying to get to. Okay, let's talk about a proposed schedule. I think I'm getting towards the end. 
Um, so we are proposing that the March, we would like to work further to try to complete the revised ordinance. In April, we would like to hold workshops with all stakeholders to introduce them to what we're proposing to do and where we're going. Um, this, a lot of this is my draft information. And then we would like to present before the board on May 24th and June 7th if needed. And we may, depending on where we are, will request a two month extension, but right now we're not 100% sure until we finish our review in March. Oh. And that concludes my presentation. I, I appreciate all the work. Uh, I think there's so many things happening in CD. As you said, there's building, there's code enforcement, there's um, planning. And, and I, I feel like my statement will swipe the rug from underneath you, and I apologize for that. But in the state that we're in with our drought, uh, I was just speaking with Supervisor Scott about it. Uh, we are currently at approximately 0.5 feet Rumsey. Last year we were at one foot Rumsey, so we're half a foot behind. Granted, we don't know and there's no crystal ball that's going to tell us how much rain we're supposed to get in March or April or May, but sitting down in state um, conversations, they do not expect much rain at all in Central and Southern California until next winter or next fall. Um, and so, as we progress and we find a way to make this work, that still stresses our water resource capabilities here um, as, as we keep going on this unfortunate drought. We all hope that it would end and that that was the bottom, but we keep finding new ways to reach bottom. Um, and in a way, we're tracking something, but yet not really tracking other things. Uh, and I get it, there's the right to farm, but at the same time, commercial um, agriculture needs to also ensure that residents and other surrounding properties, no matter what their use, used uh, activity has been permitted, uh, need to all collaborate together for the scant resources that a drought leaves behind. Um, and I know there's been a lot of work that's been done from the committee to your department in reviewing and looking at this, but in my opinion, we either need one or two things or both. We need an agricultural ordinance that states what processes everything needs to go through to ensure continued access to water for things that are already here. And number two, maybe we need to have, have a limit on how much cannabis right now we allow because the more we allow the more the market continues to crash granted every other county is doing its own thing to help with that crash uh, and i think the applications that are in they're in but maybe we just need to say right now no more applications period at this moment in time um, we are now talking about a last year it was exceptional drought now it's a 1200 year drought uh, so I, I'm concerned of all the time that's been spent on something where the industry has crashed, uh, water is becoming continuously scarce, and yet all this work put into that. So uh, again, don't mean to pull the rug from under your feet with all the work that's been done, but I'm very concerned about continuing um, at this moment in time, other than the applications that are in, because that would be very unfair to those that have already uh, made an effort to start. Um, so just putting it out there, just because I, I think it uh, should be a part of this discussion today. Um, and then you said you had numbers for LACO, wondering if you might have those uh, available. I do not have them with me. I can send them to you individually. Okay. Can I, can I jump in for a second here? Yeah, yeah no. I was... I'm glad you brought that up, uh, all of the things. Um, you and I are on a different committee, kind of committed to the long-term uh, drought management part of it, um, which also Mary is part of. So um, that conversation definitely needs to continue. Uh, we had a lot of conversations about what's sustainable for our county. And that's one of the reasons um, she showed how many uh, applications we have for each district. And that is a conversation that we want to have. We had it many times in the committee. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up. And um, that is something that we collectively need to address for our county. 
folks. I definitely sure. agree with that. We need to be looking at limiting these grows because they're coming to us saying that they can't sell their product. So why would we want to extend how much cannabis is actually grown here in the county when we can't collect tax dollars from the last year? I, I'm, I'm actually really just, I don't really, I guess, grasp or understand how they grew last year, was not able to sell their product, but want to grow again this year. So I, I guess that I have that question out there. Yeah. Why, why are we continuing if we couldn't sell our product? We can't pay our taxes. I think the, the question and I think uh, Anita is oh, stopping me. Go ahead. That's a very good question, Supervisor. I don't have an answer to that one, but when you're talking about uh, limits, and certainly Mary could tell you this also, the draft ordinance that we've been putting together does address that issue and the question of whether there should be limitations on permitting. So that's been anticipated and it will be something for your board to consider, public comment, et cetera. Um, and also, <laughs> um, I, sustainability is the biggest question for us. What can our environment sustain? How much water use can we sustain? What can the market sustain? Um, and for that reason, I've asked the Cannabis Alliance to come to our board and make a presentation with their priorities and their vision so we can have that conversation directly. And that's going to be the beginning of March. Great. Thank Great. you. Great. So may I answer some questions now? <laughs> yes. So in terms of water, so where I come from, there is a process that every project that comes through the city, our water department looks at that project. It says that we have 100 whatever pounds of water. This project that's required to develop is going to take 10 of those. Um, we've broken them down by sectional zoning districts. So we have so much water dedicated for residential, so much water dedicated for commercial, industrial, manufacturing. Every project that comes in, the planner analyzes that, those numbers and say how much is it going to take for the water usage for that particular project. So my strategy is to meet with Mariana. Department of Public Works, <laughs> um, to kind of see where we can do with those numbers. Because we know on our end, from the hydrology reports, how much water is going to take, at least what the um, applicant is telling us. And then we need to work with the Water Resources Department to say, how much water do we have and can it really sustain this water? And that's the next phase of what we're doing with the watersheds and all that stuff. So that's kind of like where staff is going. Because I know that that is very important and very critical to the entire process. So that's the answer to that question. In terms of the limited number of grows, there is in the current revised ordinance where it states that we are recommending either, it's not in, um, dead and set in stone yet because we're still doing analytical work, but the reason why it was so important for us to take the GIS data and geocode it, because we had to identify the locational location of the of the groves, the size of the groves, and there was a lot of background work that we have to do to lay the basis before we can make any intelligent guesses on where we think we should go. So we can't really answer that question for you yet, but in the back of our minds, we are looking at maybe looking at um, things that we can do in, times, in terms of distance requirements, sizing of the groves, where they should be. I think I even heard one about um, maybe doing a lottery for these, like allowing so many, and then after that, we only have like a certain number, and then those will kind of go through a lottery format. But we have to continue our research and analyze where we have and where we are so we can determine what we can handle. So these are good questions, and that's where we're going, but we couldn't get there without doing the background research. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Simon and then uh, Supervisor Zabati, I'll have you let you go. Just want to, you know, thank you for the update as we're moving forward. As everybody knows, we got a lot of work to do. When we approved this, we knew it would be five years, so we're going through that process now. But um, Supervisor Sabatia, like I said, you know, Supervisor Price has already said, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, the numbers conversation, what's sustainable for this in Lake County, both from our resources and also just from a community level as we move forward. You know, I myself have talked about it a few different times, just as we have so many liquor licenses in Lake County. Um, you know, looking at that from a cannabis standpoint, you know, we want a sustainable industry with the, with the folks that are willing to go through the process, make the hard fight right now to be sustainable and be a, a positive long-term business here in Lake County and do the right things. And as we move forward, those are all going to be conversations we need to have. They're not going to be easy 
but it's a conversation we need to have at this point. And you see those numbers, 243 applications at this point. You know, if we just break it down, that's about 50 uh, projects in each district if you break it down in a five number like that. And But where is that fine line and where is that number? That's going to be the real in-depth conversation that we get to here as we move forward with the industry, with all the stakeholders, and here at the county level. So appreciate that you brought that up because we have had many conversations how we move forward with this. So excited when we get there because then we'll have that conversation done and move on with the other challenges that come with it All right supervisor spot um goodness i forgot because i was listening um i'll have to get back to you um yeah no the early activations that's why we're here or that was part a we're talking about early activations um I don't think it needs to change now, but when it does finally come back, in my opinion, uh, and please tell me if I'm wrong, uh, if you don't do grading, if you don't build structures, um, and if you don't do all the stuff you're not supposed to do uh, with an early activation, um, I believe that CEQA does have a threshold of 10,000 square feet, because I believe that's how Mendocino has allowed the 10,000 square foot process to go a little bit faster, but yet not completing the process uh, with the CEQA analysis and all that. Uh, that that would be where my threshold would be okay. You're not, we're still gonna go out and let the neighbors know that this is happening and early activation is gonna be provided so at least we can get the public comment, but at least it's a small enough patch that it doesn't harm the environment, meaning the neighborhood area that it's being allowed in. It's already uh, prescribed to be in an, a, a, a zone away from our communities. Uh, and at that point, compared to what we've seen before, we've had almost close to 80 acre grows be early activated, uh, some 15 acre grows early activated. And in my opinion, that, that right there, I, I, it's just, you are going to have some impact to the environment at that. At a 10,000 square foot, that's, that's a very small footprint. And I believe, again, that it is a threshold within CEQA. Uh, that's where I would feel comfortable allowing that. But again, it has to be tied to a use permit. It's not just... Uh, anyone and everyone can go ahead and get, get that. So actually, with the early activation permits in the criteria, it talks about projects that have adverse environmental impacts to the community. And when you look at that, we start talking or looking at the noise, the air, traffic, and all those other issues. So although it's only 10,000 square feet, it may have other impacts that we have to still look at. The issue that we're having with early activation permits is that the time it takes for staff to review those permits is almost as equal time as it takes for the use permit. If you have an early activation permit that's tied to a minor or even a major use permit, it still undergoes that same type of environmental review. I can't say at this moment that they're all exempt because they're all individual projects. And so that's something that I would have to go back and kind of flush out a little bit more. But early activation permits are taking about the same amount of time as a use permit. So we are advising a lot of our applicants that it's best to just apply for the use permit and go through the sequel analysis and all the other cumulative impacts that you would need to go to in order to move the projects forward. It would actually be a faster process because first we're doing an EA is not designed to do what a use permit does. And so EAs from what I understand is allow you to kind of set your property up to get ready for the use permit, but not to operate as if you have a use permit to operate a cultivation site. And just to add a caveat, that doesn't mean you get it for an EA. It's still under the discretion of CDD because every project is unique and every environmental impact will be different depending on where the project is, what the project looks like. Uh, but I, to me, if there was to be an early activation, my mind has said that no more than 10,000 square feet would be where I, I, I stand. If it's less than that, then absolutely I'm okay with that too. But I think any more than that, and at that point, you need a use permit. There, there will be an impact. You're starting to, especially if it's outdoor, you cannot mitigate to a certain degree the potential for the odor. Um, you can uh, do some stuff, but that will probably require some kind of grading or some kind of whatever other work that needs to happen uh, in order to try to do that. Uh, another uh, issue that hasn't been talked about, and I just want to check in to see um, if it's being discussed or if there's any movement, is the fact that we, even in our projects, we approve of 
outdoor cultivation, but then there's nowhere for them to dry, uh, whether it's on their property or we have very little amount of processing plants. Um, and, and we talked about it during the appeal process that came to us back in November, uh, possibility of maybe a temporary permit, possibility of, uh, I know that there's uh, some issues with ag exempt permit, but maybe with our new ag commissioner, there might be a new conversation to see what's available, uh, what's not available uh, within the law. Uh, but I know that that is one of the major issues is that there are not many at all dry sheds um, and that means that they're doing things they shouldn't be doing within the permit that we approve of. That's correct. So what I would like to do and recommend is that you give me the opportunity to come back and make another presentation to you regarding some of the follow-up with the questions that you have for today. Supervisor Simon. You know, just want to follow up on that conversation while we're here today and when we're talking about the early activation. And, and I'm glad that you bring it up, uh, Supervisor Sabatier, because, you know, going forward, that's a discussion this board needs to have. Is there a place for early activation? Or are we really trying to get this where they get their minor use permits, their major use permits, and get these things solidified for long-term success uh, here in Lake County? And, and as you heard directly from the CDD director, having those two paths has just compounded the situation where we have the backlogs. And we really need to talk about that as we go forward. When we talk about streamlining, that is a big time conversation we're having every time we we meet as we as we move forward so I appreciate the conversations that are coming up today uh, as we move forward and I was glad to see you know that there are some processing uh, projects that are looking to apply I know there's some real important ones that could help establish the industry here for the drying and the you know everything that needs to happen that missing tool for the industry so uh, hopefully as we're moving through this process we can do that as far as early activation when we started I think we had uh, the intention to really prop up the industry the best that we could of what we knew at the time. Um, but we've seen that it has caused kind of like I said, a, a bottleneck because they're going for it in both, both for the use permit and for the early activation at the same time. So it's kind of creating the double work process. And what we've also heard from our constituents and other things with early activation, it doesn't always give them the exact opportunity to come in that a use permit or a major use permit would do here to come to the board and bring their concerns. And we know we've all heard that. And we really got to work from both sides just to establish the industry to help help it grow and establish itself here, but also to listen to those community and constituent members uh, that have the concerns when these projects are going by them. So those are all things we're going to have to figure out between now and July. And uh, I'm glad that we've got off to a good start having the meetings, but um, we're going to obviously hear from the community here and our constituents in the industry in public input. So I appreciate the time today. And you raised some great questions as you're moving forward. Go ahead, Supervisor. So I you said July, uh, and I get it that that was on the timeline for the revamp of the ordinance uh, to get it all finalized. Um, and, and I'm not saying I want that to happen earlier. It'll happen when it happens. But early activation, I think we can make a change rather than continue a moratorium on something that we seem to be aiming for either absolutely limiting or eliminating mm -hmm. uh, that by July, uh, if we make that decision, then it's already too late at that point for the entire season. Uh, so I, I would not be against eliminating early activation uh, in order for us to continuously focus on our use permits, knowing that that is more of a long-term gain versus the early activation that's only a six-month gain. Um, so I'm just putting it out there yeah. in order for us to let the industry know that either A, it's still possible and by July it's not possible, or that B, we're just making a decision that, of what it is that we want rather than continuing to postpone a decision that does impact their capabilities or not. Um, that. Thank you. Heard loud and clear. Yeah. Supervisor yeah. Paiska. And we'll be having those conversations in the workshops in April. Okay. So I have a question for the board. So would you like to see me back in March or you just want to see me in April? I mean, see me back meaning with the updates of the questions that you've asked for further information about or would we like just to handle that in the workshops? I think that 
Go ahead. If, if I may, Thanks. by the time you get to the workshop, you're going to have an ordinance uh, prepared and for proposal. I, I'd like to see it so that we can comment on it in case we want to make changes before that gets offered uh, at the workshop to really get the stakeholders. Um, that that would be my preference. I, I, she needs the month of March to, to finish the draft. It could be early April. <laughs> <laughs> Anita, did you have any input? I, I see you looking over here. I don't have my glasses on. So Okay, good. You were just looking in this direction. I thought we were wavering on oh, something. I was just looking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to be good. That's but we do hear your request, and we'll meet that on the CDD committee and make sure that we're moving forward with bringing something back to the board so we can have those discussions. We'll communicate that with... Uh, Mary as we move forward, but appreciate the work that's been done to this point and um, We understand the urgency. Thank you very much. I think too that Thank uh, you for all your work. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Supervisor Pliska. I want to thank all the staff. I, I know it's been a, a pretty crazy year um, for the entire department and the staff um, have really hung in there and they've worked really hard. You've worked really hard and um, we have so much gratitude for everything that you've been doing. So thank you, and thank you please much. pass that on to the staff. Will do. Thank you so much. Have right. a great day. Oh, I would leave yet because we still have to do public comment. Yeah, we still need to come. <laughs> but I also wanted to add one last thing. Sorry. Um, in regards to uh, what, what whatever decision we come to, or um, with with the with the study and the research that you'll be doing before you come back or work with the on. Um, is, for example, when we decide either early activation or not. In the meantime, while these projects are already essentially bottlenecked because we'll have limitations on them, in that time maybe we can, um, we can put more of an emphasis on the illicit grows with code enforcement since the water limitations and all of the other things are in place. At least that way we can minimize that element of what's kind of putting us in this predicament as well is the fact that some of these folks that are actually legal grows are deciding, I'll just go illicit then, you know? And so I, I, I think that was the whole balance initial, initially was to try to get people away from the illicit grows to the legal grows. And so um, that might be something we strategize, of course, with code enforcement. And then even with us, with, with uh, putting some more funding towards more officers or something like that, I don't know, but just coming up with a plan and that aspect to it. Yeah, I think that's great. So the code enforcement officer has already been working on a strategy. So it was in my presentation. I probably didn't present it as well as he probably could have, <laughs> but we are moving in that direction for, Ill for illegal grows. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, is there anything anybody else has? Um, and then let's see. Uh, I don't see anybody online with their hand up. Is there anybody in the audience that has a question. Yes, it looks like we go ahead, come forward and you have, yeah, three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Crandall. Thank you, Supervisors. My name is Erin McCarrick. I'm from Clear Lake. I am also the treasurer of the Lake County Cannabis Alliance. And I definitely want to take a moment to thank you guys for listening and having this update. Thank uh, Anita and Carol, the tax department. And a big thanks, a big thanks to you, um, Director Darby. This information is just a present, you know, it's amazing. And in the amount of work that you've done and the time that you've been here, fantastic. Sorry, it's a weird way to look at you. <laughs> there you go, fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, just a couple things in terms of, and also very excited to give the presentation, not myself, but the Lake County Cannabis Alliance in March to really bridge the conversation gap um, that, you know, we need, we want to make sure that you guys are aware of the impact. So just a couple things from the conversation. One of the questions about why keep growing one of the things that I don't think we've mentioned much is the lack of dispensaries. So you can't just go to Safeway and pick up, you know, an evening edible like you can for wine or beer. So there's not enough dispensaries. So hopefully in this next year, there will be dispensaries to help meet the need of people. Um, additionally, I did have a question. Uh, we'll get into more of that like in the presentation, but uh, the one question I did have was, um, I had a question and then a request. Uh, the question is, of the 33 early activations that are pending, where are they in the status of the, um, the process? Are they, are they lined up to go to the Planning Commission? Are they out for CEQA? Are they at the Lake Co? Where are they? And then the only other, then the request that I had was um, 
to really include anybody from the industry, it's kind of like you spend weeks and weeks, or in this case, months and months, baking a cake and then realize the recipient is gluten-free. So if somebody from the industry was helpful to, you know, bake the cake, you could avoid a lot of the, a lot of the uh, pain at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you wanted to... Uh... Oh, you want me to answer now? Yeah, okay. yeah just, probably I'll better while, turn while it's fresh. To talk to me. Okay. So in terms of the 33 projects, I can let you know where they are in terms of the early activation permits. Each, indi each individual project has its own process, and so I would have to look it up based on the um, project itself. So if you want to call me or email me, I can provide you with that information. Thank you. Joan, if you'd like to come up and uh, state your name for the record, and you have three minutes. I'm Joan Moss. I represent <clears throat> the press, and I'm also on the Big Valley Mitigation Committee for the Groundwater Sustainable Plan. And I just, just want to make sure I ask some questions. I believe Mary Darby is working at your direction. I found some blame addressed to Ms. Ms. Darby for doing what she's doing. She is making this ordinance at your direction and request. If it's a mistake to spend all this time on this ordinance, it's not her fault. It's what you told her to do. And I'd also like to know who decides about the adverse environmental impacts of what is happening? Who decides what those are? And I want to make sure that you understand what she said when she's developing an environmental impact report. The research that I'm doing when I talk to different people who are concerned about water is criticism about the vineyards. The vineyards depleted the water of Lake County. But you've already established that the vineyards are agriculture and they're valuable. I believe that cannabis is not just entertainment. Cannabis is medicine. I'm just telling you that's the feedback that I get from people that I talk to. And I think the agricultural impact of all agriculture is important, not just the water hauling by the illegal cannabis growers. And many illegal cannabis growers are, are growing their six plants. And they have children. And they have animals. So how are you going to discern how they separate their water? And I know of farmers. I know of families. When the vineyards start using water, the wells of the neighboring farmers go dry. Thank you for letting me make these off the subject comments, but it's the things you need to be aware of, I believe. And I command Ms. Darby, I understood everything she said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, if you would like, if you have an answer for, thank you. So thank you, Ms. Moss. I just wanted to say that in terms of the adverse impacts, environmental impacts of properties, we look at that based on our CEQA guidelines and our initial study. So there is a checklist that we go through. And I can share that with you if you like. Thank you. And then it looks like we have someone coming up to the mic. My name is Michael Wegner. I'm a consultant working here in Lake County, Sonoma County, and Napa County, uh, and Mendocino for cannabis cultivation. Um, I've been here at these meetings a number of times for, well, a relatively long time now. Uh, things in the conversation have evolved, but some things still seem very uh, consistent. Um, and I think one of those is what Ms. Mosk was bringing up is we're talking uh, as far as water uses, right, it's an important topic and it has to be addressed, but we're really only subjugating cannabis in that conversation. And as an agricultural community, it's a much bigger conversation and a lot of other impacts or, or things that are being um, associated are not also being kept track of. So 
my point, I guess, is just that agriculture is now cannabis, you know, based on qualifications of two years as an agricultural crop. Uh, I remember when this first started, Steve, uh, uh, AJ. Yeah, uh, he, he made a very good point that it's not a commodity, it's not an agricultural crop until it's been here for two years. Now it's been two years, so it is an agricultural crop and it would seem like there has to be some kind of uh, balance between different commodities, because that's really what they are. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up was this market fluctuation that we see and we talk about uh, the ups and downs of markets, right? And the cannabis market is very new, which also makes it relatively unstable, okay? So it moves a lot because it's just beginning. That will eventually become less volatile because that's how markets work. So taking just this year in, into context, it's, it's a... a it's a very small piece of a much longer time frame. And I think you have to keep in mind that these, these fluctuations are going to happen. And last year was a really bad year and for a lot of different reasons. When we talk about overproducing or, or producing too much cannabis, uh, we're only talking about California right now. Okay, so if we make rules that subjugate this county to a certain restriction, uh, when it becomes federally legal, We've handicapped ourselves severely because we have one of the best places probably in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere to grow cannabis that could then be shipped, exported, so on and so forth. So keep in mind that it's not just the California market, it's the bigger market that will emerge. So don't handicap our small community by over, overriding the rules. Just something to take into account. Uh, lastly, um, I, I think with the revamp of uh, uh, the laws and the rules that are going to be controlling uh, the cannabis production, it would seem like it'd be a very good idea to have an ad hoc committee <laughs> that people from the industry could be involved in too, like Aaron was saying, give you insight. Um, that was a major issue in Sonoma County when it first started. Uh, they didn't have an ad hoc committee, so they made a bunch of rules that didn't work. And because they didn't work, they had to rewrite those rules. So what they did is they brought a bunch of people from the industry, and this is like 2010, 2011. Right. They right. brought them, brought in the stakeholders Feeding. and got input. Thank you, thank you. Does anybody have any? All right, uh, it looks like we have somebody online uh, with their hand up, thank you for your comments on that. Um, phone 6205, you can state your name for the record, and uh, you have three minutes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. This is Bart Levinson. Um, I wanted to uh, mention a couple of things. Uh, yesterday in Mendocino, uh, an announcement was made that uh, water for agriculture will be limited this year due to drought. And I just wanted to make sure that our county was aware of that and what was going on in Mendocino. Um, also, uh, I haven't heard, perhaps I've missed it, uh, the uh, study of the impact of increased truck traffic to roads uh, is making uh, in uh, tearing up the roads and creating wear and tear, and uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, mixed residential areas um, and uh, areas where the roads are essential for uh, fire evacuation and fire help. And I wanted to ask, it seems to me that there is an opportunity to ask of this incoming industry to more proactively address, help, say what they can do to um, contribute positively in Lake County towards our uh, shortness of housing, uh, about our increased fire danger and fire risk. Every new project is, is going to take away uh, the needed resources if there's a fire from other places that might have had more help 
if these new projects were not there. And I don't understand why the projects aren't being asked to be uh, much more uh, clear and um, and and actual in their planning for their own fire mitigation and fire fighting, uh, as well as housing. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Does anybody have any insight on uh, some of the questions or? have not heard about the impact on roads and I don't know how easily that information would be available without having a baseline of what the roads were like prior to the increase in water trucks going around. Uh, I know that we didn't ask for that and so I don't know if that information would be available. Okay, thank you for that, Supervisor uh, Zabatier. The only uh, thing I will update is in our use permits that are given, which are learned during the ballot, there is a road impact fee as you're applying for there. It is a small set fee. I know that uh, it is implemented. Uh, we had suspended that during the Valley Fire, but I know we brought that back uh, a few years ago. So a request of our public works director. So there is a road impact fee when you do a project in Lake County, so. Thank you for that, Supervisor Simon. All right. Um, Julia Bono, you have your hand up, uh, three minutes, if you can uh, state your name for the record, and we'll go forward from there. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is Julia Bono. Um, with respect to this issue, I have a very simple point to make. Our county seems more than willing to allocate scarce resources to the cultivation of grapes for wine and other uh, alcohol-related uh, purposes. However, this is a poison. This is a poison that has afflicted uh, numerous communities and it is not something that we should be um, you know, allocating resources to. On the other hand, it kills people. It kills two million people a year, according to the World Health Organization. On the other hand, we have cannabis cultivation. Cannabis never having killed anyone or you know, a remarkably small number of, of individuals if it has ever happened. Um, we really should be putting this into perspective and allocating resources to the least harmful of these two intoxicants. And cannabis also being um, notably useful for various me medicinal purposes. So um, I would just put my, my uh, voice and vote on the side of um, allocating resources to the cultivation of the least harmful um, uh, substance. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'll go ahead and close public uh, input and bring it back to the board. It looks like it was, this was uh, only for a report only. And so, Director Darby, thank you so much for your, for your work. The Community Development Department Code Enforcement, thank you for your hard work on this. And we look forward to the next time we can discuss this and get somewhere with it. Thank you again.